<laughs> yes, this will be known as your worst audio podcast, but your you know best intended podcast. My name is Jamie Howard. I'm doing my fifth attempt at a podcast with Tom Rowland as he explores new media in his attempt to take over the fishing and outdoor landscape. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? I'm Tom Rowland, and this is the Tom Rowland Podcast. Hey everybody and welcome to the podcast today. This is episode 20 and it's with filmmaker and friend Jamie Howard. You guys know Jamie. He produced iconic films in the fishing world like In Search of the Rising Tide, Chasing Silver, Location X, Andy's Return, Bass the Movie, and most recently he has spent four years chasing the striped bass migration and documented it all on a film called Running the Coast. I worked with Jamie on both Chasing Silver and Location X, and they were two of my favorite projects that I've ever done outside of Saltwater Experience. I love Jamie. We got along great right from the beginning. And, you know, we just had a good time doing those movies and and had no idea really at the time how they would turn out. And uh, it was it was beyond all expectations. Jamie turned out some amazing movies that uh, really made a mark on the on the fishing world. Today, in talking to him, I learned a whole lot about what it was that got him interested in making films. And with all the time that we had spent together, I had never really asked him, or maybe maybe I just never really understood what the driving force of him really changing his entire life and devoting it to becoming a filmmaker. And today, I learned that 9-11 had a big, big impact on on Jamie. 9-11 changed, really changed all our lives. But uh, I guess if you were living in New York at the time, it had a particularly profound impact on the people that were, were living there, obviously. Jamie was working for one of the largest ad agencies in New York and therefore one of the largest ad agencies in the world. Pretty fast-paced life. And uh, after 9-11, he really kind of rethought things and and decided to go down this path. And so I, I kind of explored that with him about what it was. Why, why was it this fishing path? Why, why not a different path? Really enjoyed the conversation. I think it's, his story is fascinating. I think that it took real guts to make a big change like that. To see him come out the other side as a successful filmmaker and to have really made such an impact on the fishing world, is, it's, it's really awesome. Today's episode takes place on the phone. Jamie and I have tried and tried to get together and either go fishing or get together and sit down and do this podcast. And we've tried it a number of times and and have been unsuccessful. We then tried many times to get on the phone and either had poor Wi-Fi or just a bad headset or I just wasn't comfortable with the audio. Finally, we started working it out. And that's why in the beginning of this episode, he jokingly says this will be your worst audio podcast ever. Thanks to my editor and friend Tom Hardy from Podcast Pro, it turned out pretty good. So really happy about that. Tell me what you think. You can email me, as always, podcast at Saltwater Experience. Let me know if you thought the quality was good enough. Anyway, I'm excited about this one, and I hope that you're going to enjoy it as well. And as always, tag me on Instagram and let me know that you're listening. You can tag Howard Films as well. And you can also send me an email at podcast at Saltwater Experience. Lots of you have been lately, and I really appreciate that. You've been given some great suggestions for future guests, and I have tracked some of those down already. So I hope to have some of your suggestions coming at you in future podcasts. You can also... Maybe you'll be a fan of the week, like this week's fan of the week who sent me an email, Max Baumgartner. He says, I became a member of Captains for Clean Water after listening to the podcast and bought my best friend and fisherman, Don Crowley, a membership for his birthday. Planning to try to make some phone calls to my legislature regarding WRDA bill and donate some time. Hope my two- and four-year-old boys can enjoy Florida Bay when they grow up. Thanks for helping to bring attention to this pressing issue. No no need to thank me. Thank yourself, and thank you to everybody else who has taken action 
after the podcast uh, with Daniel Andrews and Captains for Clean Water, that issue is in the forefront, and it's really, really important that we all try to uh, do what we can. So thank you, Max, and thanks for being the fan of the week this week. And this week, this episode is brought to you by Waypoint TV. Have you cut your cable? You thinking about it? Lots of people are. Waypoint's a free service that has well over 2,000 episodes of the best outdoor hunting and fishing shows anywhere. It's free, and it's available on Apple TV, Roku, Amazon Fire, Smart TVs, your phone, your tablet, your computer, iPad, every other device. Check it out. It's free, and it is awesome. So now, let's get to my discussion with filmmaker and friend, Jamie Howard of Howard Films. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the podcast today. I have with me one of my good friends and longtime friends, somebody that you're probably familiar with because his films are some of the most iconic and interesting films that the fishing world has ever seen, in my opinion. Jamie Howard owns Howard Films, and he has done films such as In Search of a Rising Tide, Chasing Silver, Location X, Andy's Return to Chasing Silver, and also Bass the Movie, and I may even be missing some. But, uh, oh, I am. I'm missing the, the most recent, and Jamie's here to tell us all about that. Jamie, what's going on? How are you doing today? Yes, sir. Good, good to be here. Yeah, I think you left out running the coast. Which running the only coast. Four, four years of my life. Yeah, how could I forget that? <laughs> <laughs> running the coast, four years. So, Jamie, I want to know. I mean, we've had the opportunity to work together on two films, and both of those were really fun for me. You're you're a fun person to work with, and you bring Todd, and Todd is also a fun person to work with. <laughs> But we did Chase and Silver together, which is a Tarpon movie in the Florida Keys. And then we did Location X, which is where you blindfolded me and wouldn't let me know where we were and fished with a masked guide in an uh -huh. unnamed location. And that was also super fun. I loved yeah. it. And both of those movies were very well received. But I'd love to know, I mean, it, even with us having worked together a number of times, I didn't fully get the whole story of how this started for you. Like, I know that you you were in the advertising world, but it always kind of seemed strange to me that you were able to just take off so much time because the way that you're filming your movies is far different than the way that we are filming our television show. You're taking a year and a half to do a 20-minute thing, or in the case of your new movie four years of your life to put together a four-part DVD series. In that time, I will have put together four full seasons for three different shows and had plenty of time to do other things. So how, how is it that you got into this and how do you have, how, how are you able to put so much time towards it? <laughs> Because uh, I think I'd rather have your job. <laughs> I'm definitely doing it the hard way, for sure. As I said, as we talked about before we even started on air, I said, given that I'm in the professional audio video business, this could still be your worst uh, podcast for audio. But I wanted to check. Does it still sound okay? Yeah. Yeah, we're doing, we're doing better now. And for everyone okay. to know, this is, this is a, an audio telephone conversation which we're recording and I'm 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 trying to embrace this technology more. I haven't been happy with the quality of the uh of the of the telephone interviews, but I'm I'm starting to put my arms around it and Jamie's a good guinea pig. I thought that he would have all this high tech <laughs> audio equipment, but it turns out he's doing it just like everybody else. But let us know yeah. if you if you hate this and we won't do it anymore. Yeah, yeah. Did, see, tell, if this is the podcast, for sure to tell us when you when if you hate it, this would be the one. <laughs> <laughs> this is the time for people people to start <laughs> emailing you that this does not work for me at all. That's but, right. Um, podcast yeah, is so saltwater Howard, experience. The Howard Films, the Howard Films story, is not been a little different than yours. You know, this has all been a little bit of a flyer. It's been a bit of a, a wild gamble. I think everyone, I always say, everyone has to have one thing in their life that they're willing to take risks and not be fearful. And that one thing, hopefully, is something that that uh, is an important part of your life. And I think for me, that was uh, filmmaking. And so when I decided to 
take this crazy journey, not too far after 9-11, I was basically just taking some savings and got on a plane in an ice storm, went down to the Bahamas. It's sort of been catch, catch can all the way through. In other words, there was no sponsor for that. That was on my downtime. That was after 9-11 and the agency was, for all intents and purposes, going to be shuttered for a little while. And basically, you know, the first day, the camera guy wasn't even there because of an ice storm and you're just, you're spending your own money. And I think to answer your question, I think all these movies have been a bit of a risk and even Chasing Silver, which, you know, which is even playing in the IGFA Hall of Fame was really, you can bleep this if you want, but it was really a shit show getting that made. You know, I mean, you know, you got you falling off the back of a boat, uh, <laughs> taking out our audio the first couple of days. <laughs> You've got, you know, me uninsured with like, you know, $90,000 cameras because there was no smaller camera back then. And, it, and that was that was on my vacation. You know, I, I, by that time, I'd worked away to to another advertising job. I Before I was working at the biggest one in the world, but I decided I'm going to just put it all on black. And I was working at a smaller agency. And I just negotiated my vacation time. So I would do this on my vacation time. So that's what my vacations were. It was just, you know, filming and, and editing at night when I came back. And so, wow. you know, when I'd see you guys, it didn't make a lot of sense how the heck we were doing this. Well, this was, yeah, this was on my dime and just taking a risk each time. And fortunately, the DVDs, you know, the, maybe it was the timing, the technology was right. It was a little bit before YouTube had completely taken over and people appreciated premium content in the fishing uh, arena. And that's why I decided to go into that arena because I thought maybe I can do something different. Mm -hmm. You know, there was a lot of traditional fishing shows, Bill Dance and the like were awesome. We all grew up with them, Jimmy Houston. And then Walker's K of course moved the bar and they were shooting on 16. So I thought, you know, if we could do something like that, but go just a little deeper with the film stuff, we could do something pretty cool, but it would require a hell of a lot of, uh, time, effort, and risk. And uh, most of the time when I saw you, I was, I didn't even know what day it was. <laughs> Fortunately, you showed up and really, um, you embraced it. You know, I always felt that people that embraced these projects did well. Uh, they can remain nameless, but there were a few folks who just were very incredulous about what the hell huh. we were doing well, a lot of places we went. Yeah, I can, I guess I can see that because it was something, something totally new. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I always thought of it when you were telling me what you were doing. I always kind of thought of it as Warren Miller. That's what came to my mind at first. Yeah. Is like this guy's trying to do like a like a Warren Miller film of fishing, and I love the Warren Miller films. I'm not even a big snow skier, but I just love those movies. I love how he does them. I love how they're kind of more casual. There's still production value to them, but it was kind of like just he was just sitting there kind of uh, doing the voiceover himself. And mm -hmm. then he introduces the audience to these young players like like Glenn Plake at the time. And he had this mohawk and and he was just this awesome skier. But he was definitely beat, you know, living to the beat of his own drum and. Those films just captured people's imaginations and they captured people's imaginations from the ski world, but also people like me of just like, man, this is an amazing way to tell a story. And that's what I thought of. The first thing that I thought of when you when you were describing kind of what it is that you were that you were after and you sent me in search of a rising tide and, and Andy Smith didn't have a, a, a chartreuse mohawk. <laughs> but, but I kind of got the same feel like, like this is kind of Warren Miller-ish, like really, really cool. And I, so I was sold right away before, before we had even met. I was like, you know, if that's what you're trying to do, what's the worst thing that could happen? You know, I mean, it's, you're, you're going to produce some kind of movie about tarpon fishing. It, it's probably going to be pretty good. So I was, I was all in from the beginning, but let's, let's wind, wind it back a little bit. Because this advertising agency that you were working for, you say it's the biggest one in the world. Was that in New York? Yeah. Yeah. All right. That so was, that was in New York. Yeah. You're in New York and you've already mentioned that 9-11 was a big part of your decision to kind of step back and, and rethink things. Were you in New York on 9-11? 
Well, I was not. My mother was. I had a, by that point, I, I had a decent apartment on the water. I'd figured out a way, you know, I think you probably like me would not, rather not be in New York City. So I figured out a way to kind of get around it by having, you know, I looked out facing the Hudson, you know, I'd worked my way to that point, but I had left as I often did. I can't remember where I was, maybe in Montauk. Actually, no, I was in Charlottesville, Virginia. I was at home and my mother was in my apartment. And because she loves New York, she she was a kid there in Gramercy Park. And, um, you know, like most people, when it happened, I didn't believe it. And she had called me and said uh, the, the building was smoking. And I told her like a really good son, don't worry about it. No big deal. <laughs> <laughs> don't worry about it. You know, it just shows you how sort of what a great sixth sense I have for disasters. So I, <laughs> she... Uh, <laughs> She, like a great mother, as the bill, as the first building went down, she put nice uh, wet towels on my window so no smoke would get in. She arranged all my stuff. And then she um, was trapped in the middle of a major disaster. You can actually see the Twin Towers from my apartment. So she could look out, took a couple of photos, still didn't quite understand the gravity of the situation. And then everything went black. As the building went down, she was enveloped in smoke and then was taken, went down the fire escape and was in, was taken by a complete stranger. I think it was an African-American guy, took her by the hand and they went to a lifeboat on the Hudson and sort of made their way around and got over just before the uh, next building collapsed. And so I was watching all this from afar and it took me a while to really realize what was going on because I'd lost contact with her. But as I did, boy, that was... That was scary and really uh, surreal because you just can't wrap your head around it. You know, you don't really believe the Pentagon's getting hit. You don't really believe that it was, a, you know, a jet. And so, you know, that was uh, that was all part of the 9-11 experience for me. That was sort of was, became a family experience. And I thought, you know, that air quality is going to be so bad, which they didn't really want to talk about too much. And that's a slightly political thing. but long story short, I took my time coming back and sort of. Were you able to make sure that your mom was, was safe? And, and then did she get out? She went over to uh, where they had everyone, I guess, on a base in in, uh, New Jersey. And then she ended up having to make a decision and she ended up taking a train somehow. I don't know how she, she got off it. And she went up to a friend, a childhood friend living up on 72nd street and just hold up there. And then she somehow, I think after two or three days, got a train, got a train out. And thank God, I mean, it was really scary from this end, not knowing when it, when the, when the phone went out, that was really scary because I knew how close I was to the building and I literally had no idea. So there's a few hours there where you're just kind of hearts in your chest and you really have no idea what's going on. And as the news Unreal unravels, you sort of get a clear picture of it. And, that, you know, that was, again, right before it was just a wash of social media. I mean, now right. we've, we've seen the entire plane flight from both, from all angles. We know exactly what's going on. But back then, there was still a little bit of a confusion. Yeah, um, and I would imagine that, obviously, you're living in New York. You've got an apartment there. You're entrenched in the in the whole city and that life. So not only, I mean, obviously your mother is who you're worried about the most, but you've got friends and, and people that you're working with, people that you've known for years also gone through this, right? Oh, yeah. I have, um, you know, a number of people who were lost contact with, who had sort of sent me cryptic notes, cryptic messages about what they saw. Someone saw the jet fly over their head. Um, and I'm like, what jet? And it was, uh, you know... It was very strange. I mean, on so many levels. I mean, there was shards of paper flying through the air for weeks. There was, you know, pictures that I'd get from people of, you know, half half to a foot of, you know, dust um, just outside their door. So I think it was a long period of recovery, but um, the city was amazing. Uh, back when Giuliani had all his faculties, he was uh, sort of co-piloting that. And I think um, it was amazing to see the city work 24 hours a day 
to do that, to, to pull it back. You know, I went back and visited the site and um, there's two big holes there with waterfalls. And then the Freedom Tower, I think they call it now. Yeah, I've um, been it's there. It's beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful. Yeah. yeah, I've been there. It's a it's a sobering experience. I mean, you go there, you kind of, I mean, we, when we went, we were, I had my whole family up there. You know, we're going to see Broadway shows. We're going out to nice restaurants. And then, you know, it comes to the day that we're going to go see that. And everybody's just kind of bebopping along, having a great time. And then, man, the, the, just the weight of that whole place just, just sinks in when you go there. Yeah. It is, it was, it was definitely the highlight of what we did in New York. And, um, all, all everyone remembers it. And we just, um, just spent, you know, a lot of time there. I think we didn't plan anything else for the whole day and we just planned on going there and I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know what, you know, what size of a, a museum it was or, or, or what, what there would be. We spent a lot of time there and the kids yeah. had a lot of questions because my kids, uh, you know, Turner now is about to turn 21. Hayden is, uh, almost 19 and Hannah is 14. So wind that back to nine 11, they were, they were little babies. I was out of touch that day also just, you know, was, I mean, that was, that was so long ago and the world has really changed so much since then partly because of that, but also just because of technology and social media and everything else, just like you were talking about. We we talked on cell phones like you just talked on a regular phone. It was just like carrying a regular phone. There wasn't much texting. There wasn't much that time like there is today. Uh, certainly no social media. And uh, so you just get back into reality and you the world's changed. It was a it was a very very strange time. I know a lot of people listening are are the you know our age and and really can remember exactly where they were and what they were doing and probably every second of that day. Other people are younger, you know, like my like my my son's age, and they they hear about nine eleven, but they weren't adults at that time, and that was just such a day that that changed so many people, and um, and it had that effect on you, right? I mean, like. Is that what you were telling me before that that you were you went through nine eleven and then took a bit to kind of step back and rethink your your life? Yeah, sorry, you'd broken up a little bit there, but I think I caught the the, the tail end of that. But I, I think um, yeah, there was definitely uh, on many fronts a lot of big decisions to make after that, and so you know, is decided to take a couple of risks. I mean. You know, the New York ad game was enough of a risk, but this was a different kind of risk coming up. Yeah. So, but and, the but um, the ad agency, some of these decisions were made for you, right? You said that the that the ad agency kind of boarded up for a short time, or yeah, it was um, it was a time where you know we we were sort of given the right to say you know, for for physical and mental and also just business reasons, things were a little bit off the rails there, and then I decided to turn that into an extended leave of absence. And I went out to L.A. to edit it. So, again, nothing by the book there. But um, I had a friend who was way overqualified to be editing my project. I think she was doing something for Oliver Stone, I think, at that point. <laughs> so really absurd, really absurd that I was going to bring her this little tar all this tarpon footage. But um, she didn't know anything about fishing. So actually it sort of helped me because I could sort of guide her through it. But, um, yeah, so it was just basically took a leap, took a flying leap after that. And, um, and so, so getting back to how you decided on, on fishing, I mean, you probably got a lot of things in your, in your, in your life that you're interested in. How was it that you, that you settled on, on fishing for this new project? Well, you know, I really think there was, it was sort of a combination of a passion and practicality. I mean, I really thought I can get after this in a way because I've been doing it since I was so young that I could find some insights that other people might not have, or at least I was young and stupid enough to think so. But I, <laughs> I thought I could do this in a way, and since it hadn't been really done to the extent that you know NFL had done with their films and other things, that I thought we could do it. So I just decided that this was going to be my way in. If I was going to be making films, I, I thought I would do it about fishing and I would probably try. I thought there was a visual, there was such a cinematic thing about it. That's why I thought the Bahamas would be a great first place to go. I thought, how could you get away from that level of eye candy? And then if you combine a story with it, it's kind of like cheating. You know, I could, 
I can tell a story, but then people are, they're not really gonna be able to look away. Mm-hmm. And this, of course, is an SD. I mean, we were very proud of our technology at that point. We had our, can- <laughs> we had our Canon camera and it was pretty awesome. And everyone was really excited about it. But uh, looking back, oh my gosh. Yeah, it was, it's not quite what it is today. Man, there has been so much that has changed. So what year is this that, that you're starting on In Search of a Rising Tide? I would, yeah, I guess that was about 2001. So in 2001, there was a pretty high barrier to entry for something like this. Uh, like you say, the cameras were $100,000. It's hard yeah. It's hard to even fathom that. You could spend yeah. $100,000 on a camera now, but yeah. uh, you can also spend $5,000 on a camera now that would blow that camera away. Hell, an iPhone. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're seriously, you could... The the quality of what you could do with an iPhone today is yeah. so much better than what that hundred thousand dollar <laughs> camera was. I mean, we were filming on Beta, like yeah, you know, and we, I wouldn't even use that to hold the door open today. Yeah, but what? Well, what chasing else? Silver was expensive cameras, but Rising Tide was not even that. Those were like Sony nine hundreds and Chasing Silver. But I think in in Rising Tide we had whatever the fanciest SD camera was. I guess they were those little tapes. They're like little tapes. Yeah. 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 It was pretty much a news, a news, uh, rig, like what, yeah. the, what the guys use to, to, uh, to shoot the news and, and, um, you know, they'd hop out of their truck and they have the, the camera that goes on the shoulder and it's got a, yeah. a beta, beta tape in it. And, yeah. um, and that's what we were using too. Now, the, the funny thing is, is that the, the lenses haven't changed that much, but the, the, certainly the camera technology has, has changed so much. You know, when I think about so much of that time, one of the things that happened in Chasing Silver, which really put that film on a much different level than anything else around, was a crazy idea that we discussed in the boat one day. Of, of <laughs> I know where it, you're going with this. <laughs> wouldn't it be cool if we, uh, could, if we could see... Well, yeah, we, we we might have ended up killing Todd, but yeah. wouldn't it be cool if we could see these fish migrating from the air? Yeah. And then you're thinking, uh, you know, maybe that's a good idea, but I'm not, I don't have five thousand dollars to to hire a helicopter for an hour. Right. And then we're thinking, well, it's hard to shoot out of an airplane. And I'm <laughs> like, dude, I just did this last week. I there used to be a a, a ultralight with with pontoons and i used to hire that guy to go and look at the tarpon it was it was an amazing experience and uh dangerous as hell but yeah an amazing experience and i remember we decided you know what todd what do you think and he's like yeah i'm all about it i'll do it which none of my camera guys uh on saltwater experience would would go up in the ultralight so i was like cool this guy says he'll do it and so we went right to the airport and put him put him on that deal. Uh, actually, yeah. it wasn't even on the airport. He took off in Key West Harbor, no, and yeah. uh, and just went that, right down the ocean side, the Tower Flat, and all the way down to Boca Grand Channel. And that footage, I remember seeing that footage for the first time, and it was mind blowing. Because, and, and I look at it today, and it's poor Todd was doing his best best he could, but it's shaky. It's yeah. SD. You know, you're flying by these fish at, at uh-huh. 20 miles an hour. They're going uh-huh. two miles an hour and you just zip right by them. But yeah. at the time, that was world changing. Yeah. Don't you think? Yeah. I, I mean, I remember that guy. He was, I don't think he had shoes on. <laughs> I think he was down there and he was in shorts, amazing Key West tan, long hair. And I think actually the guy, it was Brian. I guess Todd didn't join us until the next shoot. Yeah, Brian, who was already, that's a story in itself. And I doubt he'll be listening to this podcast, so I think it's safe to say. But he he had told me that he could do anything, dude. And he was like, bro, I got this. And he was like, you know, I, I scaled K2. I've shot in all conditions. And I can tell you that that shooting Chasing Silver was, he said, it closely he's come to dying. Um, <laughs> he said the sunburn, the long days, the heat. The dehydration, you know, I can't, I gave him the warnings, wear long sleeves, wear a hat, wear SPF, pace yourself, drink liquids. He didn't, he just thought, no way, I'm way too tough for this because he'd shot extreme movies for the Warren Miller, you know, type genres out west yeah. of Jackson Hole. So we, we put him up in that ultralight 
and just said, you know, try to get whatever you can. And the guy basically like put out his cigarette, flicked it over his shoulder and said, let's go. And I saw Brian disappear over the horizon. And <laughs> oh, man. We but, also, you know, he, we he also, got some shots. Yeah, he got shots. Shot. And we also uh, timed it to where I think we even got some shots of, uh, of running the boat from the we air. We did. We did. We got some great stuff. And, and at the time, as you said, you know, now there's drones and the level of perfection is just now is a price, price of entry. Guys in high school are shooting incredible openings on their drone. But what made this special was, like many things in, in the art world and life, when you do something first, it has significance. And thanks to you, we found a way to do it. And um, some of those long sweeping shots where you could see the fish down below, I think was a game changer. And it allowed, uh, thank God, for us to come up with a way to really capture the magic of, of what the hell was going on. Because I think a lot of times in fishing, there had been such an emphasis in the past on just the catching. Yeah. You know, the, the, the catching was the biggest deal. You know, when the rod bent, that was when you were, that's when you were getting the audience happy, but we take a completely different approach, sort of the film approach of sort of, you know, wait on that, build suspense, wait, 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 show everything around it, show everything but the catch. And um, that was one of the keys to it. And so thank you. You're, 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 <laughs> I should have given you a producer credit for well, pointing us towards that guy. Well, that was more of a, uh, uh, man, I've been trying to get my camera guys to do this. Nobody's crazy enough. This guy says he can do it. So let's send him up there. I took a look at it again before we did this podcast, just to, yeah. just to go back and see you know, some of the things that I thought were so cool the first time I saw it. And you know, would they stand up over time? And unfortunately, those particular shots, it would have been better just to have them archived in my memory because, I mean, seriously, just like you say, kids in high school, my son has a Pelican case with a drone and a small Sony camera in there that has yeah. more technology than we had on our first six, seven years of of saltwater experience and, and uh -huh. you had in, in your first four movies. It's, it's yeah. simply incredible what's changed. I mean, we're talking about the technology changing between 9-11 and now just with the texting and cell phones and social mm -hmm. media and everything. I mean, the world has really, really changed. And so has so has distribution of content and everything. So what, what about that? What does that look like for you? I mean, at the beginning, uh, in search of rising tide, you're, you're selling DVDs. Yeah, And how are you distributing your content now, like this new movie that you have, which is all about the striped bass? Well, you know, it was, uh, you know, a progression. You know, the first one was DVDs, and then eventually it found its way to TV. And the second one was, again, my investment, and then TV found it, and then they wanted to invest in it. So we had kind of a, you know, we could, we could do DVD and television. Now, I would say both are gone. I would say... The networks have become consolidated. I think they have a different business model. Um, I think they're, you know, so what we found for this last movie was a combination of DVD because we still had a loyal group of people who really wanted that, you know, the library, all the stuff we'd done in the past. Mm -hmm. You know, some people still watch Chasing Silver. You know, we had kind of a lot of original music in that and a lot of, you know, things that you may not be able to see again including your kids hiding in a rainstorm. <laughs> I forgot about that. <laughs> For the worm hatch. <laughs> I forgot about that. That was crazy. We had, I, not to digress, but I remember I've got to get a worm hatch in this film. And you said, all right, I got it. Let's go. And then with the blackest, darkest clouds I've ever seen in my life started rolling in. And we, I'm I sure said, your it, wife it's, it's cool, this man. day is probably questioning it. I said, it's cool. We're only going to go about a half a mile away from here. It's it's fine. When Once it starts going bad, we'll be right back. I don't want to be in the <laughs> rain any more than you do. And you're like, okay, I got it. Okay. Yeah. You've been good so far. And I remember that, man. We went out there and sure enough, the worms, the worms were, were doing their thing. The tarpon yeah. were there. Every It was all coming together. And mm -hmm. then the wind started blowing literally 30 five miles an hour mm -hmm. as a, as a storm approached. And, and Hayden was my, was my helper that day. Yeah. And I was like, well, we can't go in, you know, what, what are we going to do? We got to do this. Here's my, <laughs> I don't know how old he was at the time, probably four, maybe. Yeah, probably. I don't know. And I'm yeah. like, here, just get in this stripping basket 
<laughs> and so he was small <laughs> enough. He was small enough just to get in the stripping basket and and take shelter from the from the rain. And he was fine in there. I think he I think he had a snack, and he was just eating his little snack in there. Yeah, Dad. What was what did he say? What was the iconic phrase that he kept saying? Oh, you kept saying, "Is it? Be, is it? God, what did he say? Something about is it because of the worms?" And you're saying, "Yeah, it's the it's." <laughs> why are we out here? Is it because of the worms? Because of the worms. Or yeah, why, why the it's because of the like worms. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that's so funny. I haven't even thought about that oh, in, in years and years, but um that's that's so funny because that's the time of the year it is yeah, right now. Chaos. We just had a worm hatch. Pure utter chaos. I mean, I again I will have to talk at some point about production to be you have to just know that chaos is is coming. It's part of the deal. And so, you know, you, you talked about distribution, but when, when you finally get to that distribution point, um, if you're trying to make a movie in the outside, you know, busted equipment, you know, people behind that can't want enough out of there. I mean, I think we were sort of blackballed. People attempted to blackball us in Almorada. Uh, <laughs> it's a good memory. Yeah, um, that, yeah that, that's probably not, think, not all that uh, fond of a memory if you were getting blackballed out of Almorada. I remember some... Um, some tests, <laughs> some some problems that we had. We had issues with the weather, and I remember uh, on a couple of days, either it was the rain at the worm hatch, or or uh, just blowing harder. And finally, one day we, you call, okay, what are we doing tomorrow? I said everything looks good. I've got Fitz Coker on the bow, and we're going out of Key West, and we're going to we're, we're going to get it tomorrow morning. It's going to be fantastic. But the crucial thing is we need to be at the dock at 10 to 5. And you're like, what? 10 to 5. And I'm like, yeah, we're going to get out there and we're going to let the sun come up around us and you're going to get the most amazing shots you've ever seen. Okay, I, we're in, right? So we go. And I remember this so well because we had a similar camera that had a similar issue at the time. And it was this moisture, this moisture issue. And we would have to be extremely careful about leaving the camera outside. So you've got this $100,000 camera that now you have to leave outside of your hotel room so that the moisture yeah. deal doesn't go off. This, was, <laughs> this, this would lend itself to a great night's sleep. And so we yeah. go out there and sure enough, it is flat, calm, so flat and slick. And we pull into this area. It's totally black, dark. And we start saying, okay, it's going to happen here. This is going to happen. I know it's going to happen. And we can just start to hear a fish roll in the distance, you know, and then a fish rolling a little closer and a fish rolling closer. But it's that time of the morning where it's just so quiet and the sun is, is so down that you can't even see them rolling. You just hear them. So you and your cameraman start getting everything ready. As the sun starts to come up, the moisture indicator will not let us shoot. And there are fish all around us. And somehow, by luck and the grace of God, the, the camera started working right at the moment that fish are rolling between the camera boat and our fishing boat. And Fitz Coker's on the bow, ready to make the cast, makes the cast to a fish between the camera boat and the and the uh, and the camera, it was yeah. it was incredible. But it came so close to not happening because the, I mean that was like the last second that that ca that the camera started working. That was that was totally bizarre. Oh, I remember that. I remember that. I remember the the the, the, the pain and the agony of just sitting there. Everyone's trying to remain as calm as they can while while the sun was rising and we couldn't shoot it. Yeah, and you know. And you just think this can't be happening. Oh God, this can't be happening. And then you're just you're watching the sunrise, and you and you have and you can't record it. And then, as you said, you know, again by the grace of God, <laughs> we got that shot. I asked you. I said, "Is that a pretty good shot?" And you said, "I don't think we, anyone ever got a shot like that before." No, no. At and the I time, said, at know, the time, that you. was just unbelievable. I mean, the the yeah. camera boats are sixty. 60 or 70 feet apart and a fish rolls directly in between them. And that was kind of what I had thought 
it, uh, about going really early like that is let's don't go there and then just pull into them. Let's go there and sit and let the whole environment, you know, kind of get used to us. And, and, you know, I knew right where the fish were. So maybe I had landed right on top of them and, and, you know, almost intentionally. And then given 30, 40 minutes, everything starts to kind of become a little bit more used to everything and then they start rolling and it rolled right between the two boats and Fitz makes the perfect cast. I don't remember if he caught that fish or not, but it was just that shot of him making that perfect cast to that fish that just so slowly just rolled. It was, I had never seen anything like it before. Uh, and, and even today, that would be just an unbelievable shot to get. I, I remember, I don't think we actually got that fish we got one similar to it later, but I remember Fitz was always good for his reactions after a fish would, <laughs> would, would, would leave town. He'd always have a good reaction. You know, he'd always have a good quote, you know, that sort of deep South summary of what had just happened, you know, Oh, phooey. Yeah. Or, you know? Yeah. Or, or many other things that he could say. Fitz, yeah. Fitz always entertained me with his, uh, with his, um, humanizing of the fish and he, right. he we would we would get there early in the morning and he would see you know four or five fish rolling all together very 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 slowly and he's like tom Is that the poker yeah he's tom they're in there playing poker and we're gonna <laughs> roll up in there and we're gonna mess up their game <laughs> <laughs> and he'd throw his fly right in the middle and catch the biggest one of course he was he was definitely the the best tarpon fisherman i ever had a chance to fish with and uh what made him even better was was his ability to to put in human terms what we were seeing and as mm -hmm. a young guy that didn't fully understand what i was seeing man it sure did uh, that was huge for me i mean i'm like okay he's like yep yeah, they've been here all night long playing poker they started when the sun went down <laughs> and i'm gonna cast at the one with the biggest stack of chips <laughs> and i'm like how how do you know which one's got the biggest set, stack of chips? He's like, it's that one right there, Tom. Boom. And he'd catch it. And I'd be like, <laughs> damn, that's incredible. But, but just the, uh, just the ability of him to, to tell these stories and his, in the way that he told them was just, it was, it was amazing. But we've, we've definitely reminisced about, um, the fun of, uh, of, of chasing silver. And that really was one of the most fun, once yeah. to me we also got rich on that one and, and he and i uh went up there and fished in long key bite with you and that was super fun location x was super fun but i want to hear about i want to hear about this new well two things i've never talked to you about uh bass the movie which mm -hmm. you're fishing with a couple of people that i know well regard extremely highly uh, one, Bill Dance, who uh, has been a mentor to me and just an all-around awesome guy. So I want to know what it was like working with him. And was Shaw Grigsby also on that Bass the movie? Did you work Shaw with Shaw? was not on it. Yeah. Um, he, most of our sort of big names were up front in the movie, and they were – we wanted to sort of create a background to the movie before we went to California. And um, so – we spent a lot of time with Bill, but it was ended up being in the special features. He's in the movie, but it, but the real candid stuff, we sort of get into, you know, he passed on medical school and some of the things that happened in his young life and car accidents he'd seen. And, you know, if you get him away from the, as you know, if you get him away from the TV and the, he's got kind of a real Bill Dance personality, which you can't, it is impossible not to love it. I mean, right. it's bigger than life. It's just amazing. But he's actually a, a, a down to earth guy as well. I mean, he's there's a person in there that's willing to just kind of, you know, have a chat about anything. And yeah, really anything, kind of, and you know. and also go on for a long time. Like, <laughs> you know, he's one of the busiest people that I know. But he's also one of the people that I know that would just sit and talk to you for however long. I mean, mm -hmm. like if you, if you get that time with him, he will just sit down. I did a podcast with him and it's mm -hmm. one of my favorite ones that I've done to date. And, you know, I mm -hmm. like this hour and a half format because mm -hmm. if it's just a 30 minute format, somebody like Bill Dance or, or so many of these people that I'm, that I'm sitting down with, they have their kind of canned interview, 
that right. that and and they they don't even know it, right? Like if you were to right. ask Bill right. Dance, you know, you know, Bill, what's your favorite thing about fishing? He's got you know, a response, which is a well thought out, honest response, but it's basically the same thing that he gave the radio station. And it's the same thing that he gave, you know, whoever else just called him. And I find that this hour and a half format to two hours, the good stuff comes in the middle, right? Mm-hmm. And he, he did exactly that. He really loosened up and, and really told some stories and he had some, some of his cameramen were there and, and the people that he has, um, had working with him. I mean, that was one of the things that I, I, I have a, a tremendous amount of respect for him is, is that everyone that works there has been working there for like 25 years to 40 years. You know, he Amazing. treats his people really well. He's a great leader and they stick around, but those cameramen, I, I ask him, I said, have you ever heard him tell that story? He said, no, I never heard that story. And I was like, okay, score. We, yeah. you know, yeah. that's, if, if these guys have never heard that story, then that's, that's huge. And he told a story about, you know, his, his favorite lure. And I, I don't know if that's one that he, I, I didn't actually get the, the story, the exact story that he had never heard, but there were, there were stories that, they, that they, these guys had never heard. And, and I just thought, okay, that's great. But that, none of that stuff happened before the 30 minute mark. Right. Right. right? And, yeah. and that's probably what you, you did too, is just sit down with them long enough and not just him, but any, anyone that, uh, is in the public eye, I think, or, or really just anybody. I mean, it takes a little while to, you know, you sit down and you have a conversation mm-hmm. with somebody, all the good stuff's not going to come out in the first five minutes. You yeah, say, no. Yeah, you avoid, and you try to avoid the cliche, try to avoid things they've done before just so you can kind of get their brain moving in a different direction. Yeah. And, and um, make it clear that you've got time to spare and they've got time to spare and think good things happen. Um, right. When you work with him, you're also working with Kevin Van Dam, right? Yeah. Who else is in that movie? Well, there's um, Mike Iaconelli was in it. Uh-huh. I mean, in terms of you know name, you know name brands and things like that. But but the movie itself was built around guys that people might not know, and it's sort of and waters they might not know, and so that's where we sort of again went away from what you expect and we went exploring we went you know sort of like went over to the reservoirs that are sort of you know covered in wildflowers and you know some really weird stuff happened there was actually a a, the the the, there was a closing the lake was closed because of the um they, they they didn't want any sort of these parasites to get into it but we had a boat one boat that was grandfathered in we got on that boat so we were entire entirely by ourselves on sort of one of the iconic lakes, just at the perfect water level, and there was a shad boil going off, and there was no one there. And there, you know, it can get a little crowded in California. And we just had, I mean, if you talk to anybody who was on that shoot, they still laugh and giggle about it. And I think, you know, it, it really became sort of going and exploring, and you really never, ever know what's going to happen. And because we build in time, you know, as you said, I'll, I'll shoot for a long time just to make, you know, maybe an hour and then we might shoot for days, weeks. So this happened to be one of those days where it just went our way. And what I found was the local guide there, his name is Mark Matrani. And, uh, he really had no idea what we were doing. Kind of like same with you, like what the hell are these guys doing? Cause we don't really say much before we show up. We just show up with cameras. We don't, our whole thing is we don't really spend a lot of time pre-interviewing, zero expectation. We just show up with cameras and it caused a lot of confusion because I think his partner was very incredulous about what the hell we were doing there and why. And so he's, his partner ended up spend, spending the first day with us. And at the end, he said, I have no idea what you guys are doing. I'm out of here. That none of this makes any sense. Because <laughs> I think people look at what I'm doing and, and rightfully so, it doesn't make any sense. I mean, where's the sponsor? What is your time constraint? What are you getting out of this? What am I getting out of this? And it's always like, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to shoot until something cool happens, until it feels like a movie is in my hand. So we just we just took that approach. And whether it was talking to Bill, I just showed up. And he was very kind. And we just chatted. I mean, he's a hilarious guy. 
and super nice guy. Same thing with the other guys you mentioned, like Van Dam and Ike and Ellie. We just took those moments. And then we proceeded up to the Delta, which is truly magical. And it's got just miles and miles. You get lost there so easily. And they're sort of fighting a bunch of water issues up there, constantly fighting for agricultural rights, wants to drain it, you know, for that giant bread basket of the country. And the fishermen want it because it's a wonderland for migrating birds and animals and fish. And so we went up there and we shot it and we documented it with a guy named um, Bobby Barrick. I don't know if you ever heard of him, but um, he's a local and he is a wild man. I mean, he <laughs> lives to bass fish. I mean, there's a story about him. One of the New York Jets was in a bar one time and he pushed up on, on uh, Bobby, who actually used to be a, just a bagger at Safeway decided to, before he decided that bass was going to be his life. And he said something to, I think it was a linebacker for the Jets. And he said something, he's like, you got a problem? He said to Bobby and Bobby said, Bobby stood it, you know, he looked at him for a second and then he took his foot and he knocked the hat off the guy's head with his foot. <laughs> and the guy was like, whoa, you know what, dude, we're good. <laughs> and so that's the kind of powder keg I was dealing with up there. And I think if you see him fish, you'll see just he's unbelievable. He only fishes with a frog. I mean, he's just that disciplined. He fishes some underwater stuff, but he sort of made his frog fishing famous. And he caught some absolutely huge fish with us. But like any movie, there, was, there had to be one thing that went wrong. And this time it was my fault. I ran out, of, I came out, I was ran out of film or batteries. So there I was with Bobby and it was the hottest I've ever been on any shoot, including the keys of the Bahamas. It was Dang. inland in, in California's gets up over 105, 10. And I was sweating and he was, and he was dipping and spitting and fishing constantly without really barely even speaking until he found a fish. And he looked at me, he said, you getting all this, you getting all this. And the truth was I was, I did not have, the camera was no longer working. <laughs> And I, I did not tell him, and to this day, I don't think I've ever told anyone that, I was not filming. And there was, um, for that half that day, I don't know, I think Todd was back downloading cards uh, back at the car, getting the memory out, you know, downloading them. And I had, um, I had to fake it because I did not have the guts at that point in my career to tell Bobby Barrick that I actually did not have a way to film him at that moment. The camera was actually out of juice. So I put it on my shoulder and I looked at nothing <laughs> until, until the boat finally came to a place where I could find and have him uh, give me a new rig. So that was, uh, that was unbelievable. That really was. <laughs> Fortunately, the movie still got made, but yeah, that's the life. Man, that's so, incredible. And, anyway. That's so funny though that, I mean, just, so many people ask about, you know, the making of, you know, how do you make a TV show or a movie? And you know what? There's so much, there's so much to it that is not glamorous at all. I mean, it is just everything that can possibly go wrong goes wrong. But the crazy thing is, is that occasionally, occasionally everything goes right. Like what you were talking about, you're the only boat there this happens yeah. it's never happened since nobody's ever filmed it before yeah. and you're just there and the chances of trying to plan that are zero you're not going to yeah. get it and yeah. you just happened to be there at the time and that happens and i would say that happens probably almost as frequently as when everything just goes wrong both cameras right. are down the engine's right. broken yeah. You're sitting at the dock at 3.30, the mechanics working on the motor, you right. know, basically lost day, but you decide, well, let's go for an hour, you know, once the motor gets fixed and you see something that is, that is so incredible that it's hard to even, even imagine or that the camera starts working miraculously right before something amazing happens or, or you're, you're in the edit bay and you're looking at the footage and it's all out of focus until right at the second <laughs> that the money shot happens. And there it is. It, everything snaps to focus and, and it's perfect, you know, or the audio, something's going on with the audio, the cables pinched or, or there's all this, you know, white noise going on. And then somehow just boom, it, it fixes itself. And then you get the, the most iconic piece of the film as, as far as audio goes 
at that at that moment as soon as it clears up like not even enough time to 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 really edit it it's like cut right to it it's, <laughs> it's just amazing how how that kind of stuff happens and i you know you try to explain that to people and 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 it happens so often that that you even forget about some. I mean, like well, while we're sitting here talking, I'm sure we've both remembered a couple of different things that were going wrong or something that was just amazing. But I don't know. I mean, there were that that time with your when your camera wasn't working and we were in one of the best tarpon situations I've ever seen. That was uh, that was tough. But I'm sure that you've had others, and we haven't even begun to to talk about this running the coast. Running yeah. the coast is a movie about the striped bass migration. And you had mentioned that you would like to do something kind of about it. And I have a friend who is a big striped bass fisherman, and he had actually put this thought in my head a while back saying, hey, look, this is super cool. What happens here is is amazing. These fish migrate the coast, and once they're going from, you know, way down south to way up north, and I don't even know enough about the striped bass to know if they're going north or south, but one of the few fish that I have, haven't spent any time fishing for. So when your movie comes out, I'm super interested in it. And yours was going from north to south, right? It started north and then went south. Is that right? Yeah, Chesapeake Bay to Maine and back. So from south to north, yeah. Okay, so from south to north. And goes through a tremendous amount of geographical differences. And then the striped bass just as a whole is, a, is an interesting fish. So. Had you always had your your mind on maybe one day doing something about the striped bass? Because that's in your background, right? Yeah. I mean, I had definitely sort of been exposed to it um, as a kid, you know, out on, on the edge of Montauk. I think if you've ever been on the cliffs of Montauk, it's another thing that just doesn't go out of your head. So it definitely made an indelible impression for sure. And I think as you referenced all the chaos that ensues and all the mayhem behind the scenes, you have to have a personality with a level of tolerance and patience. So I think there's a, I think this was something that was in the back of my mind that I just sort of patiently was waiting on. And um, I think a lot of people came into the striped bass game right after the moratorium because they had, it's a fish that's very, it's subject to ups and downs. And I think the reason it became so exciting is there were so many that people were catching them in crazy ways. Now, wait, tell tell me about the moratorium. What so the moratorium was the moratorium was put into place in the uh, I don't cannot remember the exact date I should I'm, I should I'd have to look it up for you but um, it was back you know before, I'm trying to think whether it was 80s 90s it was probably 80 I can't remember when it, what year in the 90s it ended we probably have to probably have to um, edit that one in but anyway so it it when it ended there was a basically so many they had to put into place because the the stipe bass stock had dropped so far and they were it was hugely controversial and they had basically you know parking lot gunfights you know people arguing with congressmen i mean you it is really one of the most incendiary topics you can actually tackle as a as a angler or even as a politician to even to discuss because if people fish for something for a living, they truly do not want to even talk about it. Mm -hmm. Now, when they're fishing for it for a living, you're talking about commercial fishing and taking them or, or like recreational guides. Yeah. So both. both. So a lot of people, most of the time commercial guys definitely don't want it. Um, A lot of recreational guys don't want it, but mostly people who have, who have any stake in it at all financially, they just really they can't even sort of fathom it. And, uh, and so can't fathom a, not fishing for them. Is that yeah, what you're talking about? And, and they think it's, and, yeah. And they also feel like it's, it's um, an invention by, you know, one side that it's sort of like the global warming controversy. I mean, I, I think a lot of people feel like there's more than enough striped bass, but when you, when the thing is, is when you actually go and you walk, you drive and you fish the entire migration, you, you get a very clear picture and you realize it's not getting better. It's every single guide I talked to said it's not as good. 
it. And so I think there's some pockets where it's, it's still rocking. But when, when people compare it to what it was. Now, when, they, when you're you talking know, about what it was, uh, what, what kind of years are you talking about? Yeah, I think it's sort of, it's basically been in decline since about 2006. So that's a, that's a long time. I mean, that's like 12 years of decline with the peak being probably late 90s into the early 2000s. Yeah. And that's sort of like about 10 years after the moratorium. And so, yeah, I'm uh, looking at this website. I, lo- I pulled it up while you're there. Chesapeake Bay Field Office, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And it says uh, under, under the Emergency Striped Bass Restoration Act, Congress designated the Fish and Wildlife Service as the lead federal agency to determine the cause of the fishery's decline. And it says that the decline of the Atlantic striped bass was so alarming that Congress enacted the Emergency Striped Bass Act in 1979. And they did a study to assess the stock. And then it went further to include a complete moratorium. It says, uh, in 1985, Maryland imposed a total moratorium on striped bass. Virginia followed by banning striped bass fishing in spawning areas. Four years later, Virginia also imposed a total ban on striped bass fishing. However, fishery managers knew that harvest restrictions alone would not permanently restore the striped bass back to the bay. Interesting. Right. So that's why it was a little foggy for me because each state kind of rolled it out a little bit differently at a little bit different time. Yeah. And so then the, then the fishery, the, the, the fishery responds, the fishery responds to that moratorium and then there's tons around. Is that what you were saying? Cause I really don't know yeah, much about so, the striped bass. Yeah. So striped bass are sort of vulnerable because of the, the breeding stock, you know, they breed and they sort of in the, you know, in the Susquehanna and the Chesapeake Bay and the rivers and tributaries. And so they have to replenish themselves. And a lot of times you know, the breeding stock, which are the larger, the females, you know, they're, someone catches that, they don't want to put that back. And so those become ultimately trophies, but those have millions of eggs. Mm-hmm. And so the bigger they are, generally the more eggs they have. Well, yeah, much more. And so, and, and the, the best eating ones actually are, are the smaller ones as well. So you're, it's kind of a, a win-win to, to keep a smaller fish that's, that's legal, but not the biggest ones because they don't taste as good and they have all the breeding stock and you know when you catch a striped bass that's say oh i don't know you know a big one like a trophy that's a 20 that's a 20 year old fish wow and so i think people get it they take it home but i mean that fish has been dodging nets and anglers and and uh you know party boats and whatever for a long time so i just I mean, I couldn't help but just say respect that, you know, send them back on their way. I mean, mm-hmm. it wasn't really an issue with the tarpon stuff because that's a, a catch and release fish, at least in North America. So is that uh, a, not, uh, it isn't I mean, and away. forgive my, forgive my ignorance here, but the, um, the anglers and guides that you're, that you're, um, following, were there some that wanted uh, maybe that made the movie or didn't make the movie? Is there a, a culture of people that want to keep the striped bass, even with the, with the decline, or is that, ha, have they fully embraced catch and release and, and all of the recreational guys are, are, you know, letting them go? Um, everyone that I've fished with um, has embraced the um, catch and release philosophy. And it's interesting because Greg Myerson, who has the world record of an 82-pound striped bass, which is really sort of like, you know, the king kong catch of all time he's he tells me he's caught him up to 100 but he would never have killed those wow. but um he said that um he would never kill another fish and you know things get a little testy online they they tend to come after you a little bit and so he was getting you know beat up a little bit for just him killing it while advocating catch and release but you know at the time he did it he, sh- he wanted to show the world what an 82 pound striped bass looked like. Actually, he ended up winning on sharks as well. He took his, which is a, his hit on. Hey, hold, hold on. Um, you, you, put you, that bro- into, you broke up just a second there. He ended up winning. What? Have you ever seen that show? Say it again. Shark tank. Yeah. Greg won the show shark tank. Oh, cool. Yeah. Okay. So what did he win and, it with? Uh, he's he, uh, with his rattlesinker. That was the, um, 
lure that he used to win um, or, or to catch the world record striper. And it's a, it's a he actually out his back door because he, uh, he he said when he was cleaning up for his old business there was crack vials everywhere and he saw the glass and he he saw the sound they made and it occurred to him that he actually could use that sound to attract fish. Yeah, I remember that. Watch, I remember uh, that from the fishing. movie. Yeah, yeah. And so he took that same invention and Mark Cuban from uh, you know the Mavs said, I, I like that idea. And so they're, they're, they grouped up and he's going to see what he can do to help Greg sell a little more of those rattle sinkers. But, but Greg is, you know, absolutely catch and release. I don't think anybody we fished with in this movie had an issue with, with the um, catch and release ethic. I think it's just, we're, it's pushing up against people that weren't in it, more just the commercial folks. And, and um, we're, we're sort of, it's a, it's an ongoing battle because it's changing every year. People are adapting to a changing fishery. In other words, they go out, they're addicted to it like no fisherman I've ever seen. They get up at, you know, in the middle of the night. I mean, we were fishing in Montauk. We were up at 3.30 in the morning. And then we had to, you know, fish through the tide. And there was, you know, really that level of passion and devotion it comes from a fish that, you know, rewards you for walking through the dark, getting out on a rock, pitching your lure into the rocks, into the surf. And so it's changed a little bit each year that he comes out, the fishing seasons change a little bit. You know, Bill Wetzel, who I fished with out there, just an incredible guy, basically said he thinks it's probably time for a moratorium, which is kind of a bit of a shock to a lot of people. Now, if uh, they were to do a moratorium like that, would that include recreational catch and release fishing? Yeah, I, I think it would be no catching at all. I think it would just be they would just freeze it up. And so it's pretty controversial, as you can imagine, because it's so important to so many people. But striped bass have always suffered this way. They've always gone up and down. We shot this movie. We, we thought to ourselves, how are we going to do this? How are we going to make it different? We're going to be on the road for what I thought was one year. I thought, you know, we'll do this in my spare time. We'll, we'll shoot it. And then at the end of the first season, someone said, well, why didn't you shoot here? And, I, and then I realized, oh, my God. Oh, well, I'll go back and do it. And then at the end of that scene, someone said, why didn't you shoot there? And, you know, my personality, I just like, oh, God, I, I guess I got to do that. And so I would just figure out, you know, I'll take more money out. I'll, I'll drive again. We'll go here. We'll go to Maine. We'll go to Jersey. We'll go to New York. We'll go to the Chesapeake. And, um, and then someone said, well, why aren't you? Is it just a boat movie? Uh, no okay well why aren't you doing more from shore so okay okay guys we got to get back out there and then you know someone says is this a fly fishing movie only no all right so we got to make sure we got conventional and then we and then suddenly i realized we had we had we were considered shooting a three-part series of every every possible scenario but then it had to be interesting and the key was if we we're going to do all this we had to shoot for lack of a better word, phenomenons in each thing. In other words, mm -hmm. a blitz, you know, which is sort of a biblical thing to see off a of Montauk, or sight fishing with a fly rod, or a, a worm hatch, mm -hmm. you know, in Rhode Island, or, you know, go up to Maine and find them on white flats. And then we, then I dug through the archives at the IGFA to find, you know, uh, films no one had seen and a generation and and weave those in and so it really became this sort of like you know if i'm going to do this i guess i've got to there's no going back and so it kind of just became a blur but it, it, there was no going back really at that point yeah and so as you said you would have probably have shot god how many episodes would you have shot, <laughs> would you have shot the time it took me to shoot my my two-hour movie a lot more than two hour, hours a lot more than yeah. two hours but you know, it's just yeah. a it's just a different project entirely. Yeah. Well, the movie is the movie's incredible. One of the things that I've gotta I mean, I'm almost embarrassed that I have no striped bass experience on the coast. We fish for them inshore or, or mm -hmm. uh, in freshwater, I should say. Uh I've I've caught those fish and they're from what I understand, they're basically the same fish, just living in a lake or a river right. rather than mm -hmm. out offshore or, or, uh, in the ocean. 
but I, I really just don't have, I mean, I'm only 49 years old and I've spent a lot of time fishing for the fish that I have in, you know, in my repertoire, tarpon, permit, bonefish, those type of fish just haven't had time to go and spend the time for the striped bass, but I'm intrigued by them because they're migratory fish. They're really cool. I've seen what they can do on, on rivers and in lakes. And that's, that's incredible. They, they do some incredible surface strikes and they're hard fighting fish and they're beautiful. And I really like so many things about them, but I don't know much about fishing for them. Uh, but obviously they are cool enough to elicit this response of complete obsession from, and that's what came through clearly in your movie is that, that the people that are, that are into this are into it to a degree that few other people are, despite the weather, despite the time of day, despite all kinds of adverse conditions that would keep people from going fishing in Florida, they're going. And one of the one of the ones that I like the most are the people that that just wear a wetsuit, just not even worried about anything else. It's it's like full immersion, and they're fishing the van stall reels, which are completely waterproof. That whole idea there just seems to be the most the most extreme of all the people that you you interviewed and and the, and of the t- of the different types of fishing. That seems to be the most physically extreme type. Is that is that right? Well, I would say that the the sort of the shore guys have a sort of a, a philosophy. I think it's that, uh, um, yeah, boats boats are for pussies. I think it was. I can't remember. <laughs> I can't remember exactly how it goes. I think that's it. But basically, the idea is it's just two different worlds. And I and I think I was sort of faced with sort of bringing those two worlds together. I definitely faced some pushback um, from some people who did not want to. I don't know, help us out a little bit, maybe here and there, because they thought we were, quote, boat guys. And so it's sort of like every movie I encounter some kind of thing. And when you dig in deep enough into anything, you're going to suddenly get into an uncomfortable place. And I usually think that's probably a good thing because that usually ends up being good later. Mm -hmm. But but you've got to sort of keep going until someone's probably not not happy. (laughs) And then, you know, you're probably in a good space and I don't do it on purpose, but I just know when you follow things, you tend to end up places. And so we sort of had to sort of say, look, we know that the shore guys are working their ass off. They're getting blown off of rocks. We've got footage of guys getting blown off of rocks. We've got footage of them getting drowned by waves, getting up at all hours of the morning. And I think they're truly, they consider themselves sort of the purest of the devotees of the sport and i and i think they are i mean i think they are no one's going to argue with the fact i mean greg who caught the world record on a boat we had a bunch of scenes of him getting up in the middle of the night they're hilarious he's like he can't even see straight he's actually delirious we were interviewing him in the middle of the night in a rock and if i don't know if you saw that scene but he's basically can't he's just sort of talking his stream of consciousness about you know he needs coffee he needs food he doesn't know what he's doing, but he's not going to stop. I'm not going to stop. <laughs> and he just got, then he wanders off into the moonlight. <laughs> and I think, you know, it's just two different things, but I don't think one's necessarily better than another. They can both be practiced in a way that's just as challenging. In other words, if you're sight fishing for a striped bass from a boat with a fly rod, um, you're facing a fish that just can see you, that doesn't want any part of you. Um, it's really, really difficult. And I thought that was sort of the key of sort of bringing those two worlds together is sort of showing how the most difficult side of each one, and then also having maybe a conventional guy try it and vice versa. And so, you know, going back to the idea of why are people so into this fish? I think it's because the, it's the fish that shows up at your door. There's really no other fish that's willing to show up at, at your dock in Massachusetts and then also meet you in New York City, you know, right below the Statue of Liberty, and then also pop up to a remote beach in Martha's Vineyard or Nantucket and then find them out shore or offshore, you know, miles and miles out 
Um, and so that's he that's the only fish that really does that and sort of that it's mesmerized so many people because everyone thinks they've got a shot at it and they show up and they're have big sort of interesting eye and you can't get caught up in it and you're you catch them as a kid and you can't get away from them and they just it gets in your blood i think that's what ha- happens you know you start on the backyard dock and next thing you know you're following them off on the boat and those guys are following them to the edge of Montauk on the rocks. And it's a, it's an entire culture. I mean, guys live out of their trucks. Yeah. No, I love it. I think it's really super cool. And, and I definitely need to, uh, to experience it. I think I was even in touch with you earlier saying that maybe for my 50th birthday, I might take my wife up to, uh, you know, Martha's vineyard or somewhere like that. And, um, and maybe oh, yeah. try to get a, maybe try to get a couple of days of fishing in just because it's something it's something that I just I just haven't done. I don't know anything about. It's a it's a very cool culture. I'm interested in anything that that drives people to that kind of obsession. That's would it be weird if would it be weird if I joined you guys? On your, uh, 50th? <laughs> I don't know. I'll ask my wife. I think she's be, I think she'd be okay with it. Yeah. Okay. Check. Yeah. I make sure you be, bring the cameras. We'll mic her up. And. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. No, I don't know if it would, I don't think that would be weird at all. Um, it, that's just another camera going around while we're, while we're trying yeah. to do some a family or family type project or uh, re- vacation. Yeah. I don't think it's a big deal. No, no. I'll, and, I'll make uh, sure to ask her. I'll have her call you yeah. if there's any problem. You know, um, I've been racking my brain here again about that moratorium. And I do think it's sort of, it was a late eighties deal. And so basically I think the guys in the early 90s up until about maybe, you know, 2000 and call it three. So maybe 93 to 2003 was probably the absolute peak of what caused these millions of people to lose their minds. And I think it's been slowly declining since then. And I think to just reach back one more time to an old movie, I, when I was filming Chasing Silver with Tom Evans, I saw him. He's caught several world records and he goes back to home Mesa every year and it's not anywhere close to what it was. You know, he and Lefty and all those guys, Huff, you know, those were the halcyon mythic days and they just don't exist anymore. But yet Tom goes back there 20 plus days a year, hoping and praying maybe the past will come back, but it doesn't. He might even, he might not even cast more than a, half a dozen times in 20 days, but that's how bad he wants that record. And that's how bad he wants things to be again. And I think that's sort of what fishing can do to a man. Yeah. <laughs> you can see things and you're never the same. And I, I don't want that to happen to striped bass fishing. And I, and I hope it doesn't. Now, do you think that if, if, if a moratorium came, became something that was, was being discussed that the recreational fishermen that you spent time with would be in favor of it or they would fight it? Uh, they would, they would, they would be in favor of it. I mean, everyone, it's kind of one of those things, like if you're a mature adult, you know, sometimes things in life are not fun and that you just have to do them. And so if, if people couldn't fish for four years, but I can tell you it's, it'd be really tough to do. I mean, there's been books written about it, how hard it was to do the first time almost didn't happen the first time. I'm guessing it would have, they'd have to almost be, they'd have to go down probably another 40% 40% before people are going to talk about it and Whoa. even consider it. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. seems like maybe they could, instead of waiting for it to go down 40%, maybe just <clears throat> at spawning times of the year or something, just take a month off here or there, which might, might go a long way, but I don't know, you know, all of these, all of these discussions of, of, you know, conservation, preservation of species and eliminating or, or creating certain seasons or all of those things. It's always, it's always interesting. I've been, I've been really interested in the, the, the wild pig, wild hog situation that we have in the, in the country right now. And uh, there've been some really cool podcast going on one Stephen Ranella did a did an outstanding one on his meat eater podcast that was all about he had a uh, uh a, a guy that was in charge of the of 
wild hog extermination in Missouri. And uh, he, he had a tremendous amount of information and research and, and um, all kinds of, of things to talk about. And, and one of the things that they had decided is that in order to eliminate the, the pig, that hunting was not enough and they were going to have to actually stop hunting for a, a period of time. And that whole concept just got me really interested in listening to that podcast. And then when I did listen to it, it started making a lot more sense that they can trap these hogs and they need to kill them a hundred at a time, not one at a time. And mm-hmm. there are just not enough hunters to damage the, the population to the, to, the, to the extermination level. And these things, these pigs are, are um, mating so many times a year and can do it so so quickly that they quickly have more babies than we can possibly kill. Mm-hmm. And so the idea was that they bring in these super trappers employed by the government or the state and they create these these giant traps and they build them in a way that the pigs haven't seen before the way in a way that the largest of the species can get into that pen they don't close the the trap until all of them are in there and this guy's catching them 60 at a time and uh and that is be- becoming more effective and and they were it was just this idea of of you know maybe maybe hunting or maybe you know in this situation maybe catch and release is not enough and right. if we really love this fish like we do or 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 we really want you know what's best for the land that this is something that we need to consider that maybe maybe there are situations where where hunting isn't enough and i think that it's only with certain species and and probably with the striped bass like one of the reasons why i would imagine and i don't know this maybe you can tell me but one of the reasons why it, it declined and I know this happened with red fishing. Well, let's just, I don't know what I'm talking about with striped bass. So let's just talk about redfish. The redfish became horribly endangered. Yeah. Simply because it, it lends itself to fishing techniques that are far too effective. In other words, the redfish gets in a giant ball, thousands of fish in a ball on the surface that is easily spotted from an airplane. And they can, an airplane can go up and say, there's a school right there. There's a school over there. There's a school right there. Give the coordinates to a net boat. They go and without even disturbing the fish, put a purse seine all the way around these things, pull the purse seine tight and they catch every single one. There's zero that get, get away. And that is just a, a, a fishing technique that's just far too effective. And of course they're going to go extinct. That's what needs to happen with these hogs because they're an introduced species that they're trying to make extinct. And in a lot of cases, hunters are, are maybe um, sitting outside of the traps and, and, and hunting the, the pigs as they're going into the traps, which right. makes the pigs super wary of that type of trap. And now, now they're not effective anymore. So that was one of the reasons. But I just find it an interesting kind of comparison, the hogs, to the striped bass, to the redfish, to to all of these different species that uh, at one time have had issues, and luckily for us now, the uh, you know for for a lot of reasons, the redfish is back, and mm-hmm. the redfish is back maybe in better numbers than ever before, and you know it seems like if you just give these species a chance, they will come back, but if the fishing technique that is being employed is too effective. Like you're having these, you're having thousands and thousands of, of striped bass go down a coastline, right? And if somebody puts a net there, they're catching them all. And I don't know if, if, uh, I mean, I don't know if they still do that, but at one point I'm sure that's how they were being caught. Right. And so the, the striped bass commercial guys are like really good at it because that's a species that lends itself to that type of slaughter. Like there, here's a path. We're all going down it. And if there happens to be a net here, we're all screwed. But I don't know if that's what's going on now. That certainly was what what happened with the, with the redfish. But that's, that's a interesting kind of a situation. And, and man, I would think that there's going to be some um, therapists that are going to get a lot of work if, 
these these guys that are so into it are not allowed to fish for four years. You're right about that. Actually, you can thank uh, Chef Paul Prudhomme for the redfish. Yeah, fishing. I know. I know. That, that's exactly. <laughs> I mean, he created, you know, it's not like Paul Prudhomme was out there setting nets, but Paul Prudhomme created a, a recipe for black and redfish, which was very popular and rightly so. It was delicious. Yeah, but so then, is striped bass. Yeah, and and then then you add to that that the restaurants are like, oh, here's a here's a top selling menu item. It's really easy to cook, yeah. and we can charge a lot for it because you know Paul Prudhomme has written about this. Let's get some redfish in here. So basically, every redfish, every restaurant that serves fish now has black and red fish and stack on top of that, that the commercial fishermen are like, Whoa, the price of red fish just went up. Let's go fish for those. Let's take our mackerel nets and put them around the red fish or let's do whatever, or let's change our setup a little bit and we can fish for the red fish. And then you combine that with just the fact that that, that particular method is just far too effective. So that's a, that's a recipe. That's a bad recipe. The one that loses is the red fish. That's, yeah. that's a bad deal. And, you know, if they, if there was something that said, okay, hook and line only. Okay. You can still catch a lot of redfish out of one of those schools, but you know, they go down and you don't see them anymore. And the airplane has to fly back over and spot the school for you again. That, that knocks down the, the catch 90%. Right. You know? Right. And so it, to me, it's all about the, the method but if the stock is has gotten down so far that that no one can fish for them, that's certainly not a good situation. Can't make any mistake about it. I mean, man can eliminate anything he wants. And so it's basically comes down to do we wish to regulate ourselves or do we leave it on the honor system or do we just sort of honor that fact? And so we can. We can eliminate whales. We can eliminate the striped bass. We can eliminate redfish. It's not very hard. To have you tried to eliminate technology. coyotes? Target them, huh? Coyotes and pigs might be the exception to that to that pigs, uh, argument. Pigs are tough. You'd have to kind of. <laughs> I know they shoot them with uh, like AKs at a helicopter. In yeah, but even that's not enough. I mean that that that's. No. You should listen to this podcast. It's really interesting because you would think that that would be, you know, that would be enough. But these things are just reproducing so fast, and they're in an environment where they're 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 flourishing here in the United States and they're just not really necessarily supposed to be there. So farmers are losing, you know, tons of money, tons of crops. They want them gone. Hunters like hunting them because they're kind of fun to hunt, but you know, it's almost there, there's this, there's a balance somewhere. And that's the ideal scenario there. If you got too many of things, you know, it's sort of like the deer. I mean, you don't have to feel any guilt about shooting a deer. Right. (laughs) Right. You know, but, they but need to be cold. They know, do, because, but you know. the, the, the problem comes in when does bow and arrow hunting or, or rifle hunting not enough and the, the population is out, out of control. That was the, the point of this, this podcast that Stephen Ranella did. Yeah. Brought up a lot of interesting points, but I, I think a lot of those could be translated into the, into the fishing. And, you know, we do have species that are like the hog and the coyote Mm -hmm. in Mm -hmm. the asian carp which are just Mm -hmm. absolutely take over these rivers and and they can't seem to get rid of them i mean they're not supposed to be there snakeheads is another one in florida and a lot of people like to fish for them but lake right yeah lake trout oh my gosh that's a that that that's one that strikes home with me because when I first went to Yellowstone, we could walk over fishing bridge and look, uh, look down into the water on, at fishing bridge. And there would be thousands of cutthroat trout there. Oh, I mean, man. it was incredible. It was like a, it was like a fishbowl. And then you go yeah. up into the river and there's a cutthroat trout behind every rock. And I went there just a few years ago with my family and I'm like, Oh, this is the best place. Everybody's going to catch fish. It's going to be great. You you know, it's so easy. And we get there and I'm like, Whoa, there's no fish here. Like Mm -hmm. I heard, I heard it wasn't as good as it used to be, but like there are no fish here, none. And that's the effect of the, of the lake trout on, on that. And what, where, where that comes in is that Yellowstone cutthroat is a, a species that lives only there. Mm-hmm. There are many other types of cutthroat trout, but the the Yellowstone cutthroat lives only there. So they are in 
horrible jeopardy. And how do you think those lake trout got into the the lake? Um, possibly yeah. by yeah. well-meaning sportsmen that thought, "Wow, look at this big lake. We could we could uh, we could catch a couple of lake trout in here." You know, what's the harm of bringing one of these up from? From right, this Jackson be Lake, fun. yeah, and yeah. and then they they get in there and they're like these cutthroat are so easy to catch. I am, I've never been, I haven't been hungry since I got here. This place is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and then I've got twenty wives. Uh, all I'm doing is eating and and reproducing. <laughs> it's so fun here. I love it. Yeah, Yellowstone yeah. is great. Um, <laughs> but hopefully. Hopefully it won't come to the moratorium and, and, uh, and the striped bass fishermen will be, uh, will be in great shape because the, because the species is in great shape. I, I certainly would like that because man, I would, I wouldn't want anybody telling me that we couldn't, we couldn't fish for tarpon or fish for bonefish or redfish or, or whatever. No. You just couldn't even fish for them. That would be hard to, that would be kind of hard to swallow, but I don't know. We'll see. You we'll know, see where that it's, goes. It's, it's it's a tough one, and I do. I really hope that um, that things will change. It's been a steady decline for a decade. So what I'm hoping is if we could ever level off, um, I think you know people would consider that to be maybe the new normal, and that would be good enough. Um, may not get back to where it was after the moratorium, you know, late '80s, early '90s, but at least we would level off. We just have to find a way to reverse that course because it's unlike the boars. And the lake trout, this is not introduced species, and so it's 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 vulnerable. And uh, you know, with any help, like I said, with me there on your anniversary or birthday or wherever, however we got to do it, I would enjoy I'll enjoy my time with you guys. Yeah, well, we should do it. I I uh, I'd love to talk to you about another project. That'd be super cool. We've had a good time on the on the ones that we've ones that we've done, and and uh, we just got to find something something interesting that nobody's ever mm-hmm. done before maybe fishing in space yeah yeah they got tons of fish up there <laughs> that's something we haven't done well you know what you're you're always talking about the story right the story yeah. is the most is way more important than the mm-hmm. catch and if we go to space and fish then you're gonna have to be heavy on the story because there's <laughs> gonna be very little catching but think about how much you can, how much water you can see at one shot. Like we could go up there and we could survey so much more water than we've ever done. Yeah. And and, think, and just maybe drop right down into some remote spot right at the end of it for the big ending. Like uh, Sandra Bullock at the end of, uh, what was that movie she did with George Clooney? Whoa, I don't know. I, I can't remember that. What's Sandra that? Bullock Gravity. and George Clooney. Oh, Gra- Gravity. Yeah. The, the yeah. space one. Yeah. The, the old Sandra Bullock. She's had a lot of work done. I, I had to go with my girlfriend to see Ocean's Eight, and that was um, she looked a little different in that one. Really, there's a lot, been a lot of work on the gals in that one. Huh, it's interesting. I wouldn't think that she would. She doesn't lend herself to me. I mean, I she's always been kind of natural, yeah, like, supernatural, and not like a not like well, not like supernatural, but <laughs> she's very natural looking and not not a lot of makeup, and and it it surprises me that she might have had work done allegedly. Yeah, well, done. who knows? Maybe, you know, I have to check out my websites, but it looked like a little Botox. Snope it. Snopes it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, before we go down a rabbit hole of yeah. uh, of Sandra Bullock and other people <laughs> that have allegedly had work done, why don't you tell everybody how they can find all of your films and how they can watch them? Because unfortunately, we're probably going to have to bring this one to a close, but we will do it again. Absolutely. So I think the easiest way to do it is just go to howardfilms.com. That way you don't have to search through Facebook or through Instagram. And that'll probably be a way to find us on all fronts. And I think there's trailers and hopefully uh, something for that suits your viewing uh, choice, whether it's DVD or streaming. And uh, we've, we've took the time this year to put everything on the streaming which um, took a little while, but now I think it's um, I think it's pretty cool that we can actually now share things um, instantly. And you can and access that right through the website. Yeah, you can do that. And we put stuff. Um, the new movie is on Amazon and iTunes, and everything else streams just through our site. And the good news is everything you get is yours forever. It's not like it uh, expires um in 24 hours or 72 hours or a week or anything it's once it's yours it's yours 
for good. And I think that's really good with the new movie since it's three parts. We've had, I'd say maybe 70% binge watchers, but there's also a percentage that like to knock it off part by part to actually have lives. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we've, but I always tell people, if you can get to part three, it's kind of the denouement, it's everything. And I think it's, it's sort of built that way. You sort of, you know, all the vintage stuff in Montauk and all the craziness that happens. Um, it was absolutely a crazy thing to have done to have spent that much time shooting and editing, but um, it, you know, it had to be done. And I'm glad because I've heard stories of people who've tried to do this and it ended up being, ended up, didn't end well. And I, and I see why now, because there's so much to shoot. It never ends. You know, I could still be shooting <laughs> and, you know, but how did you decide, that, how did you decide that it's time to close this out? What was the, what, was there a moment where you're just like, okay, we got enough. This is it. And I, I've for, bled, friends and I've bled family enough. Didn't recognize me. Didn't talk to me anymore. Um, I think it was probably, I was literally going by the end. I was going out on my own because I usually shoot anyway on most of my shoots and, and use more footage, use my camera as well. And this one, I was still shooting but the crazy part is, is some of the best footage in the movie was from some of the latest shoots. So he definitely got rewarded for that. So I think the end, once we realized that we had covered the entire migration route with all, in all disciplines, we called a close. I, I get a lot of emails saying, why didn't you shoot here? Why didn't you shoot here? And I just say, you know, maybe it's a good thing, you know, so the world won't be knocking on your door. Have you heard of a group called Ween? No. Yeah, there's a, a, a lead singer, a ween, I think was drunk, drunk, emailed me one night after watching the movie and said he was totally stoked. We got to go fishing. <laughs> and then I emailed him the next morning because when I woke up and just said, thanks. But I think it was done in some kind of post-concert haze because I never heard from him again. <laughs> <laughs> he must have seen it in a hotel room. <laughs> and he's, he's long gone. So anyway, yeah, I think he found it through the website, which was Again, howardfilms.com. And that's hopefully a few people can enjoy it. And if they have any questions, just email me. It's real super easy. Just info at howardfilms.com. And I'll answer any question, um, including ones from Tom. <laughs> <laughs> All right. There you have it. There's a, there's a portal to Jamie Howard's brain. You can ask him any question, how he, how he intends to fish from space, uh, all the way back to how he chose to, uh, how he came up with a concept to, to go to a place that, was going to remain nameless and, and, uh, mm -hmm. and fish with a guide that was going to remain faceless and location X. That's the sequel. The next podcast, we'll get into location X, how that came to be, but you'll have to see it first. Yeah. Yeah. Check it out. But I, I recommend that people, if you're into fishing and you're into storytelling or you're into fishing or you're into storytelling, I like the movies. You should check them out. And they're, if you're into amazing. neither of those, it's, you can do it too. Yeah. You can find somebody to give them to. Yeah. <laughs> but but they're awesome. Jamie, thanks for your time today. I really enjoy catching up with you. I look forward to working with you again. And uh, we'll do another podcast. You, you bet, man. I look forward to uh, seeing you and fishing with you soon, I hope. All right. All right. So that's Jamie Howard, J Howard Films. Go check it out. Howardfilms.com. Is that right, Jamie? Howardfilms.com? We have not changed the website yet. So we're going with that. Howard okay. Films Howardfilms.com. Right. I'm looking at it right now. You can see all the different movies that are up there. He's got uh, Running the Coast, In Search of a Rising Tide, Chasing Silver, Location X, Chasing Silver, Andy's Return, and Bass the Movie. They're all awesome, and uh, you should definitely check them out. So uh, until next time, we'll be coming at you with a brand new podcast next week, and look forward to it. Thank you to all of you for listening. This has been really fun. I love catching up with my old friends and I love talking to new people and learning new things. So that's what this is all about. Thanks for going on this journey with us. I really appreciate it. If you have anything you want to uh, ask me or you have suggestions of people that we should talk to on the podcast, we have an email address, podcast at Saltwater Experience. Hit me up there. I read every one of those emails. And if you have time and you've enjoyed this, please go to iTunes and rate and review it. That makes a huge difference and it gets the podcast out to so many more people. Share it on social is always good. But again, thank you all for listening. I really appreciate it and I look forward to next week.
See you. Thanks, Tom. See you, Jamie. Appreciate it. Jokes aside, I do appreciate you taking the time. It meant a lot to me. It's all Thanks, it's all good, man. See ya. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for listening to the show. I hope you got something out of that. Got just a little bit of news. We have started a weekly show that is designed to be up to the minute videos of what's happening this week, mostly in the Florida Keys, but also in other places that we fish as well. We'll be putting that out every week. And the best way to find that is to subscribe to the YouTube channel, YouTube slash Saltwater Experience. Search Saltwater Experience on YouTube. Subscribe to that channel and you will get updates of when a new video is published. I've also figured out how to put the podcast on YouTube, finally. A lot of people like to put that window behind other things they're working on and listen to the podcast while they are working. So we now have that for you. And there is a playlist called Podcast. There's a playlist called Weekly Show. You can go and see all the new videos that we're putting up there. Started a new email address specifically for this show. And that is podcast at saltwaterexperience.com podcast at saltwaterexperience.com. Those emails come directly to me. I'll see every single one of them. So if you have comments, suggestions, ways we can make the show better, and particularly if you have suggestions of someone you would like to see me sit down with in the hunting world, in the fishing world, in the outdoor sports world, or just a motivation, inspirational character, or someone that can teach us all something. I'm very interested in your suggestions. So that's podcast at saltwaterexperience.com. You can get the podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, SoundCloud, and we're also publishing it on the blog. The weekly show will be published on the blog too, but the best way is to go to YouTube, subscribe there, and you'll get it immediately when it's published. So until next week, thanks for listening, and we'll see you soon. Thank you.